Hello, I'm Dr. Manish Thapar, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome you to today's educational activity, addressing the unmet needs of patients with acute hepatic porphyria. This is supported by an educational grant from El Nylum Pharmaceuticals. This CME activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, which is jointly accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. If you want to, I also want to encourage you all to join us today on our live Twitter conversation at CME Outfitters. We'll be monitoring the Twitter feed and responding to your tweets as they come in. I'm Manish Thapar. I'm an associate professor of medicine uh, in division of gastroenterology and hepatology at Sydney Kimmel Med Medical Center at Thomas Jeff Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And it gives me great pleasure to uh, also uh, introduce our uh, uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Brendan McGuire. Thanks, Manish. Hi, I'm Brendan McGuire. I'm medical director of liver transplantation at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I trained under Joseph R. Bloomer, who passed away last year, and have been managing patients with porphyria for over 28 years. It's been fun to see genetics assist with the diagnosis and additional treatments become available. Our first learning objective today is to relate disease etiology and pathophysiology to clinical manifestations of acute hepatic porphyrias or AHP. We'd like to start with a polling question. We are all aware that AHP is a rare disease. So we have two questions here just to gauge our audience and the familiarity with porphyrias. First question. How many patients with acute hepatic porphyria are you caring for in your practice? None, one, two to five, or more than five. Uh, please answer at this time. Got nice little music while we, <laughs> while you select your answers. <laughs> but no, but thank you for doing this. Very helpful to us. I think we're moving on to the next question and they'll I probably show the results later, it looks like. I think we are too. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, for our second polling question, which of the following types of acute hepatic porphyrias is most common? Acute intermittent porphyria, or AIP, amino, amino levulinic acid dehydratase deficiency porphyria, sorry about that, ALAD deficiency porphyria, hereditary copoporphyria, or HCP, Variegate porphyria, VP, or I'm not sure. Okay, there we see our answers and most people did get it correct, acute intermittent porphyria. Well, very good, well, thank you. So next, um, we would like to show a two minute whiteboard animation geared towards patients, or if you like, it's also available uh, for you at CME Outfitters website. Okay, please roll the patient video. Acute hepatic porphyria, or AHP, is a collection of rare genetic diseases, often associated with debilitating symptoms and potentially life-threatening attacks. There are four types of AHP, acute intermittent porphyria, or AIP, comprising about 80% of all cases, variegate porphyria, or VP, hereditary coproporphyria, or HCP, ALAD, deficiency porphyria, or ADP. 
For most types of AHP, the disease can be passed from parents to children if one parent carries the defective gene. Women suffer symptoms more than men, although most people have only one attack or no symptoms at all. For symptomatic patients, ongoing pain and symptoms that mimic those of other diseases can interfere with the ability to live a normal life. Unpredictable severe attacks of abdominal pain are common. These symptoms could lead to physical and emotional suffering and exhaustion. AHP occurs when there's a problem with the heme protein in the liver. Heme proteins are valuable for the production of hemoglobin in the bone marrow and for breaking down medications and other substances in the liver. When heme is not properly produced, toxins called PBG and ALA collect in the liver and circulate throughout the body. ALA and PBG are associated with painful attacks and other disease symptoms of AHP. Simple tests can be performed by your doctor to confirm AHP, including genetic testing. The earlier the diagnosis, the better. Recognize and avoid things that may trigger an attack, certain medications, alcohol, smoking, or fasting or low-carb diets. Be sure to talk to your clinician about new and emerging medications that may help. It may be a difficult journey, but improvement and reduced attacks are possible. For a list of resources and questions to ask your clinician about AHP, visit www.cmeoutfitters.com forward slash liver dash hub. Unfortunately, since this is a rare disease, many of our patients feel they're alone and isolated. I encourage all my patients to jump online to either the American Porphyria Foundation or the United Porphyries Association. Both of these patient resources are valuable um, and our patients truly do enjoy it. Uh, next, uh, we'll transition to the few slides really done the overview really of porphyrias. A porphyria is an ancient Greek word, porphyra, meaning purple. The name refers to the color of urine that many occur during an attack with these conditions. There are eight enzymes necessary for the production of heme. Porphyria is a group of genetically, genetic diseases associated with a defect in one of these enzymes. Clinically, symptoms of porphyria is the accumulation of these metabolic intermediates. Porphyrias are classified by clinical symptoms as either acute hepatic porphyria or AHP or photocutaneous porphyria. These symptoms associated with AHP are related to elevated levels of delta aminolevulinic acid or ALA, which is neurotoxic or to elevated urinary levels of porphobilinogen, which when degraded in the urine causes the urine to turn purple. The symptoms of photocutaneous porphyrias are related to elevated levels of porphyria, or of porphyrins. Porphyrin molecules are tetrapyral molecules that are very similar to chlorophyll mole molecules in plants. We know that plants use chlorophyll to take sunlight and convert it to energy. Unfortunately, humans do not have the ability to take sunlight or convert it to energy. Thus, the photocutaneous porphyrias are related to elevated porphyrin levels. Almost all cells in the body contain heme proteins. 80% of all heme proteins are used to make hemoglobin in the bone marrow. The majority of the other heme proteins are produced in the liver and are important for degrading drugs, toxins, and free radicals via the cytochrome P450 enzymes. The enzymatic process of producing heme is called porphyrin synthesis. This next slide will show us the eight steps necessary to um, essentially make heme. If you look, um, starting with the glycine plus succinyl CoA, this is the actual pathway. To the right of that, then, is the enzyme needed for it. And then to the far right of that is if there's a defect in one of the enzymes, then it will be associated with one of these types of porphyrias. If you notice, there are yellow boxes 
those are the cutaneous porphyrias. And then you have the red boxes, those are the acute hepatic porphyrias. And essentially, if you look at the very top where glycine plus acetyl-CoA form, the next step is delta aminolebulinic acid or ALA. And then the next step is porphyrobilinogen or PBG. To move to the next step, which is the hydroxymethylene, it takes four porphyrobilinogen molecules to make up the hydroxymethylene. It is really the hydro hydroxymethylene and everything below that that are really the porphyrins, and that's why those are they're essentially in the white box. This is important to note because if you're considering something someone for porphyria the most likely reflex is just to order porphyrins. But porphyrins will only contain stuff that are located in the white box. You will also have to get additional, the precursors such as ALA and PBG uh, that are above. So make sure you order porphyrins plus ALA and PBG if you're considering someone with porphyria. As you notice, the last step here uh, in the pathway is the addition of iron to protoporphyrin via the enzyme ferroketolase to form heme. Consumption of heme by drugs, toxins, or free radicals will provide a feedback loop to stimulate the activation of ALA synthase. If there's a defect in one of these enzymes, there's an excess, excess of precursors um, that essentially limits the amount of heme produced. In addition, the acute hepatic porphyries in the red boxes tend to be associated with elevated levels of ALA, which is toxic to nerves and lead to damage to the central and peripheral nervous systems. Elevation in serum porphyrins is associated with photocutaneous porphyrias and are located in the heme pathway. The exception is X-linked porphyria, uh, which is an, an induced enzyme defect that increases production of the heme pathway. Finally, hereditary copoporphyria, or HCP, and variegate porphyria, or VP, which occurs late in the heme pathway, is associated with both photocutaneous and acute hepatic porphyrias, since they're associated with both elevated ALA and porphyrins. Thus, we will focus the rest of the webinar on really the acute hepatic porphyrias, or the AHPs. These are very rare diseases, and most of this data will focus actually on AIP since it makes up over 80% of the hepatic porphyrias. For AIP, or acute intermittent porphyria, it has a variable penetrance. Genomic-based estimates that one out of 1,785 patients but less than 1% of these patients will exhibit disease activity. Acute exacerbations occur in genetically predisposed patients, usually a combination of both environmental and hormonal precipitating factors. Thus, it usually occurs in females more often than men. The majority of patients develop symptoms following puberty, specifically during the third and fourth decades of life, and can occur in all races and ethnic groups. Symptomatic patients experience independent attacks that can often be triggered uh, by something specifically, and we'll go through those precipitating factors. Here is a list then of the precipitating factors for the acute hepatic porphyrias. These are all events that essentially deplete heme in the liver, thus inducing ALAS transcription or function, such as drugs, that stimulate the cytochrome P450 enzymes, crashing diets, cigarette smoking, excessive alcohol use, infections, surgeries, or even psychological stress. Now, the symptoms of acute hepatic porphyrias are related to elevated serum levels of PBG, which are being excreted in the urine, and when left under fluorescent lighting for a few hours will give it a purple or reddish color, or due to nerve damage from elevated levels of serum ALA. The nerve damage can precipitate acute attacks with painful crisis and autonomic nervous 
system disease, such as diffuse abdominal pain, hypertension, tachycardia, orthostatic hypotension, and even bladder dysfunction. It can involve the peripheral sensory or motor cyst symptoms with chronic pain, paresthesias, or motor weakness. The central nervous system can also be involved with depression, anxiety, and or seizures. Duration of symptoms are variable and can last between days to months, especially if patients are inappropriately or undertreated. Therefore, clinicians must have a high index of suspicion <clears throat> of disease, as patients can present with symptoms that can be attributed to an alternative disease process. If a patient with HCP or VP, they may present with skin lesions on sun-exposed areas. To help try to bring all these things together, we thought it'd be helpful to have a case to start with, and then we'll have another case later today too. So this is a case of an unfortunate patient with acute intermittent porphyria. This is Maggie. She's a 24-year-old female who complained of severe, crampy upper abdominal pain for three days and two days of lower back pain. She, she reduced her oral intake because of nausea and had non-bloody, non-bilious non emesis for four days. Her last bowel movement was also four days ago. She denied any upper respiratory symptoms, no rash, fevers, chills, no trauma, no travel history, weight loss, alcohol use, uh, no drug use, or not sexually active. Unfortunately, she had four previous hospitalizations over the past two years for similar symptoms of abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. During these episodes, she was evaluated with multiple CT scans, MRIs of the abdomen, upper endoscopies, ERCPs, but no cause was identified. During these hospitalizations, she required IV fluids for nausea and vomiting. Her pain was controlled with hydromorphone and gabapentin until she improved sufficiently for discharge. She says she hated going to the hospital because healthcare workers had accused her of being a drug seeker. A review of her symptoms noted bilateral hand weakness for two months. She also complained of dark colored urine and was concerned about a urinary tract infection. Her past medical history included hypertension for three years and a laparoscopic cholecystectomy two years ago during one of her previous hospitalizations for acalculus chronic cholecystitis. Unfortunately, she had two subsequent hospitalizations after having her gallbladder removed. Her only medication was amylodipine for hypertension. She works as a pharmacist, but had a difficult time working because of recurrent hospitalizations. She lives with her parents. She's single. Um, and as I said earlier, she's not sexually active. In terms of her physical exam, it's as follows. Blood pressure 140 over 90, heart rate 110, um, afebrile BMI is 27, moderate distress, moving around because she says she just can't get comfortable in bed. Her heart exam is notable for tachycardia. Lungs are clear, abdomen is bowel sounds are positive, diffusely tender to light palpation, but worse in the upper quadrants no rebound or guarding or suggestion of peritoneal signs. Extremities are normal, but neurological exam is positive for obvious bilateral weakness in the extension of her wrist and fingers and decreased brachioradialis reflexes bilaterally. Laboratory data um, is notable for hyponatremia, hyperglycemia, hypomagnesemia, and normal serum lipase levels. No evidence suggests celiac sprue. She has normal liver tests, thyroid studies, iron studies, CBC and platelets are also all normal. Pregnancy test is negative. During this hospitalization, she had a CT scan. CT scan notes abdomen and pelvis with IV and oral contrast. Normal liver, mild dilated bile ducts consistent with the previous cholecystectomy. No biliary stones, pancreas, spleen, kidneys were all normal. Small bowel, colon were normal. Scattered stool throughout the colon, no adenopathy, normal arterial and venous vessels. She also had a urinalysis. Um, with her urinalysis, um, the urinary culture 
uh, was actually normal. So now we have someone now without a diagnosis for abdominal pain, with bilateral hand weakness, and essentially we've had very similar patients, I'm sure Manish, uh, with patients who are presented like this. Unfortunately, like many other patients, they're around for a long time. They've had these diagnosis, or they've had no diagnosis, but multiple symptoms. You know, how many patients have you had like this in the past? Well, you know, I, I think uh, I, I want to thank you for presenting, um, uh, you know, uh, the patient, uh, which is an unfortunate but rather uh, uh, common presentation uh, of uh, patients and their diagnostic journey. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, there was a study out that said the average delay in diagnosis was up to, what, 10, 15 years uh, before it was diagnosed. So I think if raising the awareness and then encouraging uh, people to think about it uh, uh, is, is critical. Um, uh, if you don't mind, I, I do have some questions that came in through the audience and we can, we can just take them uh, as we are. Um, uh, I think the first uh, question was, uh, how do people describe the pain associated with AHP? Uh, stabbing, sharp, sharp, dull, diffuse, unbearable. That was one of the questions that came in. Yeah, um, I, I've talked with Dr. Bonkowski about this. You know, he was he worked with him in the past. It's very interesting. You know, some people say it's lower abdominal. I've had people say upper. I think I can't tell one way or the other. I think I've seen both. I really have. Um, so I, I have a hard time trying to say, and unfortunately, what usually happens, if it's more upper abdominal pain, they get their gallbladder out. If it's lower abdominal pain, they tend to get their you know, uterus out, your appendix out, you know, and we've all seen that too. Um, so I, I, I don't have a good sense that I could say, boy, this type of pain is really specific for AHP. I don't know if you have a better answer than that. I don't know if I answer your question or not. No, uh, I, I, I think you're right, and this is uh, one of the audience. This is one of the audience questions. Uh, I, I don't have a better answer. You know, um, a lot of times, uh, patients' uh, pain is uh, you know they describe it in different ways. Uh, it could be autonomic in origin too, right? Uh, and uh, um, and uh, and the, the the presentation of pain changes over time, especially when you have them on on treatment. Uh, uh, the key is to listen to them and then see what what, what the cause is and then you know uh, and kind of go from there. Uh, another key point that I would probably point out, even in a patient who has a well-established diagnosis of porphyria, uh, these patients are still at risk for having other causes of acute abdomen. You know, just because they're diagnosed, they're on hemin doesn't mean they can't get peptic ulcer disease. So, you know, you have to work them up just as you would any other patient uh, who does not have porphyria. Yeah, no, that's a great comment. No, I agree with you 100%. Um, right. A lot of times we just get focused on a diagnosis and we sometimes don't deviate from what we have to every time. Right. Um, let's take another audience question because I think there's several important questions which are related to the clinical presentation. Uh, I guess the next one is, the patient had severe abdominal pain, but no mental status changes. Do most people with pain-related symptoms also have some level of mental deficit? Uh, I, I usually don't see it. I'm, the only situation I guess I would throw out, I've had, you know, you can't talk about people can present encephalopathic, right? You know, what it's from, you don't know. Um, yeah, I, the only issue is, you know, you see people with seizures present sometimes. That's their initial presentation, too. You know, they'll be out of it. But that's really, you know, I don't really associate altered mental status as part of my differential when I think of someone presenting with acute hepatic porphyrias. I, I totally agree, you know, uh, and I would probably uh, probably add to what you said. You know, seizures is, like you mentioned, is, is one of them, right? Uh uh, but, you know, if they have hyponatremia, really severe hyponatremia, they may be presenting confused. But, you know, pain, severe pain itself is enough to throw you off, you know. And people can describe that as, I don't know, they describe it as fogginess and not feeling well. You know, it's just the pain, right? Uh, 
but there are other things like uh, like we mentioned that can cause mental deficit. Uh, should, should we go for another question, uh, Brendan? Or yeah, let's go. Yeah, this is good. This is good. Okay, uh, I, I think the next one is. Uh, this should be an easy one. Uh, is it possible for an individual to have both AHP and photocutaneous porphyria? Yes, and that would go with the VP um, or the coporphyria, correct? Yes. Right. You could certainly have both, uh, you know, uh, they have both cutaneous and acute symptoms. That's what you're referring to. Or, or although if your question is a dual porphyria, which has been rarely described, that'll be very, very rare in the world. I have not seen a patient with dual porphyria. So uh, technically it is possible, but I think you're referring to both cutaneous and neurovisceral symptoms. That's what you're describing too. Uh, and uh, this one, it's uh, the next one is approximately what percentage of individuals with HCP are women? That was, that's the next question. Yeah, um, I, 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 um, what was it in the, the study, the Envision trial, I thought um, oh, almost all women. That's, it's, I, I think it's like 95% women. That's my estimate. What's your or guess? HCP, yes, yes, uh, you're, you're right. So Yeah. Uh, no, I, I want to thank you again for, for the presenting uh, and the overview. Uh, but we can move on. Uh, I think we're okay with questions for now. Uh, so next up uh, is, is our next objective, which is to apply diagnostic resources to identify and confirm a diagnosis of AHP. Um, this is a patient, uh, uh, her name is Grace. Uh, she is young, 27 years old. Uh, she presented to the ED in moderate distress. She's had generalized abdominal pain for the past four or five days uh, in association with nausea and vomiting. Uh, she had trying, had been trying to lose weight and started participating in a program when she thought she developed UTI-like symptoms. Uh, she saw her PCP, send off a UA, uh, and then put her uh, on an uh, uh, antibiotic. Uh, um, she was started on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole uh, five days prior to her presentation. Uh, the only meds that she was taking was was the antibiotic uh, and an oral contraceptive for which she has been on for the past 10 years, denied any associated diarrhea, melanoma, or blood, no respiratory symptoms, no shortness of breath, and was not really taking any other over-the-counter medications. On exam, uh, Grace was mildly delirious. She was mildly confused, kind of like what the question you had. Um, um, uh, slightly tachycardic, uh, hypertensive of the blood pressure of 146 by 96, so she was clearly uncomfortable. Uh, her respiratory rate was 20 with a low-grade temp. Abdominal exam uh, was mildly tender and deep palpation, more, mostly in the periumbilical area. No organomegaly, uh, she did have reduced bowel sounds. Um, uh, pelvic exam was unremarkable. There was no visible lesions, and, and her stool was obviously heme-negative. Mm -hmm. um, this brings us on to our next question. So you suspect that Grace may have acute hepatic porphyria. The question is, which test would you recommend at this point? So we have some time to respond. Let's think about it and go for it. Yay, yes, the majority of people did get the right answer, which is uh, spot urine for PBG. Um, so so that, that's, that's, uh, that's important to get, remember that, the spot urine for PBG, um, uh, which shows uh, increased porphyrogenogen is the first line test to diagnose acute hepatic porphyria. Um, now it's important to just throw in a creatinine at the same time, just in case you have a sample which is overly dilute. Um, 24-hour collection is really not needed in the acute setting. Now, this is a recent change in the past four or five years. So no 24-hour urine collection needed, just a spot urine along with the creatinine is what's needed. Uh, now, urine specimen uh, is idly obtained when the patient is symptomatic. 
Uh, and it's important to remember that the urinary porphobilinogen or PVG levels are substantially elevated at or near the time of an attack. And then you may want to consider saving a sample for later second line tests. So as Dr. McGuire mentioned earlier, we're talking about PBG. We're not mentioning porphyrins here. It's, it's PBG that, that you really need to be checking. Uh, uh, normally, uh, you have uh, less than uh, two milligram per liter of uh, porphoblinogen in the urine. Uh, anything more than six is usually indicative of the presence of disease, uh, so three times the upper limit of normal. Uh, in an acute attack, um, the levels are usually 10, 20, 100 times upper limit of normal. Uh, and if you're suspecting acute hepatic porphyria and you notice elevated PBG levels at least three to five times, then you should consider initiating management. And we'll talk more about management uh, in the later part of this talk. If PBG levels are normal, uh, and this is where, you know, uh, uh, you should consider sending a urine for ALA and, and por total porphyrins if your suspicion is high at that point. Uh, uh, second line testing to confirm the diagnosis uh, is, 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 it relies on the measurement of ALA and porphyrins. Uh, uh, and uh, you also assess total plasma and fecal porphyrin levels. This helps us differentiate between the different types of acute hepatic porphyria. Uh, the most common one, AIP, is, is, is PBG, is, is usually sufficient. And as a matter of fact, for most of the acute hepatic porphyrias, including BP and HCP, especially during an acute attack. Uh, DNA testing uh, is, is recommended uh, when you want to know what the family specific mutations are. Uh, and uh, also uh, in testing, asymptomatic family members uh, with AIP. And, and, and the reason why this is important is, is, is because, uh, as Dr. McGuire had mentioned in his slides, that uh, uh, the penetrance of the disease is very low. So uh, you may have a genetic mutation, uh, but that does not mean you have uh, a clinically manifest disease. So that should not be your first line go to test. Uh, patients may have mild anemia, usually normocytic, normochromic. Uh, acute attacks, they may present with hyponatremia um, uh, and hypomagnesemia. Uh, impaired glucose tolerance may develop. Uh, liver enzymes are normal, although during an acute attack, they are elevated, uh, as, as we'll see later on in this uh, presentation. Uh, cholesterol and LDL are often increased, and uh, so are the serum binding proteins, if you were to check them. Now, a big question that often arises is, uh, why is AIP commonly misdiagnosed? Um, as we saw, the symptoms are nonspecific and may mimic those of many more common disorders. Patients certainly have a very variable presentation, uh, and family history is often unrevealing. Uh, and the important two of the most important things that we see in our clinical practice is is why is a the diagnosis is not confirmed biochemically, um, and then you know they have elevated porphyrins which are not that uh, which could be a secondary phenomenon uh, with underlying uh, uh, diseases, uh, and they are given a diagnosis of acute hepatic porphyria. Or, or the second most important uh, reason is an inappropriate diagnostic test is ordered uh, uh, or, or there's a testing error. Uh, that's why patients are commonly misdiagnosed. So let's, let's, let's go back to our case, Dr. McGuire. Uh, uh, um, uh, I'll let you take it off from here. I think this was your patient. Correct, so uh, this is the first case we said with Maggie. And essentially the results of her delta amino lemulinic acid, or ALA, was six times the upper limits of normal. And her porphoblinogen, or PBG, was 23 times the upper limits of normal, confirming a diagnosis of acute hepatic porphyria. The genetic testing uh, also confirmed the diagnosis of AIP. It was a missense mutation, PBG deaminase gene. Unfortunately though, it took five hospitalizations to make the diagnosis. Our hope really is with this webinar that we can actually prevent this from happening in the future by educating everyone out here today. Um, I have a few other questions, Manish, that I have, and I, and I, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, someone asked a good question. Should patient education be a greater priority since 
uh, the busy clinician has so many other uh, things to do. Um, and it's a difficult diagnosis on the radar. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to think out loud how to, how to you know, uh, answer to that question. Uh, certainly patient education is important, but I think for patient education, you know, the correct diagnosis and patient identification and treatment is also critically important. I, uh, Dr. McGuire had mentioned uh, two patient advocacy groups, the UPA and APF, which do a great job uh, 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 in guiding these patients through the journey. Uh, uh, but uh, I do think we still have a challenge in, in diagnosing patients uh, in a timely manner, as showed by the study by Dr. Bunkowski, I believe it was, and it was fairly recent, it was like five years ago, the delay in diagnosis is up to 10 years. So that is an unmet need, I think. So uh, I think part of it is 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 that, like I mentioned, uh, it, it is that we the wrong test is ordered, right? Instead of PBG, people are thinking porphyria, porphyrins. Now it's PBG if you're thinking of acute hepatic porphyria, uh, and uh, 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 so uh, and that's that's an important reason why patients are you know. And the other thing is getting providers to think about the diagnosis, and then you can figure out what test to order. I, I don't know where, uh, when I went to med school, we learned by disease activity. So we went through pulmonary module. We went through the renal module. We went to the GI module, you know, and the porphyrias just don't fit in any of them, you know, because they can show up to the neurologist. They can show up to the hematologist. They can show up to the gastroenterologist. And there's just so many areas they can show up to that it just makes it very difficult for someone to try to focus it. And, and, and I think the comment of the question too, is just, you know, the, for the busy clinician, for them to think about it, it it's not on the top of the radar because it is a rare disease. So I, I think it's a great question, but I think you answered that very well. Thank you very much. Uh, I, would, I would add going back to med school, I, I think also it is also very, it was also very fascinating, you know, even in, even in med school, right? And then I think it's just as fascinating now, so much we've learned about this disease. Uh, in the past 10 to 20 years. That's correct. And we didn't even know about the genes when I went to med school. <laughs> it was that long ago. <laughs> so it's been fun. It really has been. Um, let me throw out another question. Uh, this other question is about um, genetic testing. Um, they've had someone referred with a positive genetic test for AIP. What do you want to do next when they show up in your clinic? Uh, could you rephrase the question? So they've already had a genetic test? Correct. So the genetic testing showed up that it was positive for AIP. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do when they come into your clinic? Well, uh, so, uh, you know, I guess somebody ordered a genetic test and then we don't have an ALA or PBG. Obviously, you're going to start with the history and see, do they have any evidence of an acute attack in the past? Uh, the fact is, you know, majority of patients will have one attack or maybe none in their lifetime and never have another attack. Uh, recurrent attacks are, are, are seen in the minority of patients. So I guess you got to go back to the history at that point, see if there's something you can pinpoint. Uh, and then you can, you get, you're going to have to check in uh, ALA and PBG and see, are they excreting urine? Uh, now, if they are excretors uh, uh, of ALA and PBG, now they, they, and they are not currently having any symptoms, uh, they may be a, a whole category of patients, uh, which is called asymptomatic high excreters. And we don't know what to do with this category of patients. It's still in uh, area of study. Uh, the asymptomatic high excreters, are they at increased risk for complications? But certainly, uh, now that you have the genetic mutation, you can ask them to avoid um, medications, uh, which are the most common precipitants, right? Refrain from tobacco and alcohol, which can also precipitate an attack, and take preventive stuff. Uh, but I don't know if I would treat that patient just with the presence of a genetic attack, a mutation, sorry. No, I agree with that. No, that, that's a great answer. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, we see it nowadays. Someone goes to a neurologist, they have weakness in a leg, and they do a panel for testing, and one of the tests is for acute hepatic porphyrias. 
So. That, that that is true. And I think there's another related question. Uh, do you ever use a genetic counselor to help with the process and discussion of results from genetic testing? Uh, not sure what the standard is. I, I, you know, I can tell you, I personally have had a very hard time finding a genetic counselor to see the patient. It's kind of like finding a nutritionist. I can't even find it. You know, nutritionists, genetic counselors are even uh, difficult to find. So yeah, if you can, then I would probably agree that they should be seen by a genetic counselor. Yeah, I would agree. Mostly just to make sure all the family members get screened too. Um, especially since, you know, three of the four AIH, AHPs are autosomal dominant. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, you okay? We move to the third learning objective. Sounds good. Okay. But please keep the questions coming in, guys. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. So for our third learning objective, uh, we're essentially going to um, integrate novel therapies for the management of acute hepatic porphyrias. And let's see if I can do this better. Uh, this is another polling question for everyone out there. And this is essentially in the phase three trial of Givosaran for patients with acute hepatic porphyria. Uh, what was the mean annualized attack rate reduction in the Givosaran group versus placebo? So that's essentially talking about people, uh, hospitalization, showing up to urgent care, or needing home hemen. So your answers are 42%, 53, 74, or 91%. Okay, and the uh, answer is actually 74%. Very good. Okay. Um, you guys are on this. Great. You guys read New England Journal. I like that. Uh, so now let's move to acute hepatic porphyrias. We'll talk about the management of it. Um, so essentially, after a diagnosis of uh, porphyric exacerbation, the most non-invasive intervention is really to identify any offending medications or behaviors that activate the heme synthesis pathway. Thus, you want to avoid, you know, medications that increase productions of porphyrins through the ALS induction. These would include like phenobarbital, phenytoin, synthetic estrogens, progesterones, and sulfonamides. You also want to avoid patients from fasting, drinking alcohol, and smoking. If there is an infection, you definitely want to look for it and treat it. Uh, patients often experience nausea and non-focal GI discomfort, which should be managed with appropriate antiemetics and pain medications, respectively. Uh, safe antiemetics include andonsetron and promethazine. Safe pain medications really include uh, hydromorphone, uh, meperidine, and morphine. Administration of 10% glucose with a total of 300 to 500 grams per day should be administered. And I usually will do that if a patient comes in, you really wanna uh, give them the glucose right away because our pharmacists, I mean, they always have on hand a hemen, but it takes a while for them to mix it up. Um, so we just load them uh, with glucose until we get the hemen. And then for inpatients, the cornerstone of therapy is really intravenous hemen, which has really been available since 1980. It's the only medication that's approved for acute porphyric exacerbations. As mentioned previously, the theory is that increased levels of heme will decrease circulating levels of ALA and PPG through suppression of the ALAS feedback control. Um, heme is administered three to four milligrams per kilogram per day an average usually takes two to five days for symptom resolution, sometimes a little bit longer uh, if patients have some more or severe symptoms. The most common side effect of it um, is really intravenous hemen is phlebitis. Uh, as a result of the anticoagulant effects of heme degrading products. Thus, the risk of phlebitis can be minimized with really 
using the central axis, so like a central vein, even a pick line can work. And you should administer actually slowly. Uh, you can also actually reconstitute the hemin with albumin instead of sterile water for further, further diminish the phlebitis that will occur. It'll actually improve, improve like the stability of the lipophilic hemin. Uh, the vein really should be washed after saline, with saline actually after an infusion, and heme is generally pretty well tolerated. Um, after diagnosis and, and resolution of an acute attack, the focus now shifts to really preventing any precipitating factors, and also for patients who suffer frequent attacks that could benefit from routine administration of prophylactic hemin, which is usually an infusion one to two weeks, or the administration of givoseran. Givoseran was FDA approved November 2019 to treat acute hepatic porphyrias. Givoseran is a double-stranded small interfering RNA molecule directed against five aminolevulinic acid synthase one or ALAS1. Givoseran decreases ALAS messenger RNA1, also decreases ALA levels and PBG levels. Givoseran is given once a month with a dose of 2.5 milligrams per kilogram body weight subcutaneous injection. The Envision trial, which enrolled 94 patients with acute hepatic porphyria, 89 of those patients had AIP. Eligible patients were randomized one and one to receive once monthly sub-Q injections of givosran 2.5 milligrams per kilogram or placebo during the six month double blinded period. Inclusion criteria specified a minimum of two porphyric attacks requiring hospitalizations, urgent healthcare visit, or IV administration of hemin at home in the six months prior to study entry. Hemin used during the study was permitted for the treatment of acute porphyric attacks. The median age of patients studied was 37.5 years, range 19 to 65, 89% were female. Givoseran and placebo arms were balanced with respect to the historical porphyric attack rate, the hemin prophylaxis prior to study entry, use of opioid medications, and patient reported measures of pain symptoms between attacks. The efficacy in the six month double blind period was measured by the rate of porphyric attack that required hospitalizations, urgent healthcare visit, or IV hemin administration at home. AHP patients on Givosran experienced a 74% reduction with a p-value of less than 0.001, and also a fewer mean annualized porphyric attacks compared to placebo, as noted in panel um, on the left side um, of that slide. On the right side, it essentially shows a 90% reduction, the median annualized porphyria tax compared to placebo. In this slide, uh, this essentially shows that givoseran also resulted in reduction in urinary ALA and PBGs. These level drop quickly at two weeks and are usually normal by about one month. The most common side effects was injection site re, uh, reactions, which were mild to moderate in severity. Mild to moderate side effects include elevation in serum creatinine, ALT, and AST, but the latter really was not linked to any incidence of idiosyncratic acute liver injury with jaundice. It is recommended to check LFTs and renal function Q month for the first six months of therapy. Less common but more severe side effects include severe injection reactions and anaphylaxis. Other side effects include rash, nausea, and elevated homocysteine levels. And what about liver transplantation? The alternative to suppressing ALAS1 activation is correcting the gene defect with PBG deaminase throughout the liver liver transplantation really is an effective treatment option with almost universal resolution of symptoms and normalization of biomarkers 
with the exception of people with chronic neurologic manifestations, such as psychiatric disease and axonal degeneration, which really has not been shown to improve completely with liver transplantation. At UAB, we have not evaluated a patient for liver transplant. Um, uh, I'm sorry, we have evaluated a patient for liver transplant. We really have not transplanted anyone uh, with AHP. Um, Manish, any of you guys transplant anyone with AHP? No, 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 not at Jefferson. No, we have not transplanted anybody with AHP, although Mount Sinai has done one, and I think there was another one uh, in the U.S., if I'm not wrong. So very rare indication, but uh, definitely is curative. I think the cases we've had, it's someone that essentially has gotten um, IV hemin, and essentially they've lost all their access sites, you know, and that was a consideration. Um, someone else who had bad nausea and vomiting and couldn't eat. Um, and I, those are the only ones I remember offhand that we've evaluated. Um, but really, um, um, I, we're hopeful with current treatments and even future treatments that transplant will even be less and less of an issue regarding this. Right. Um, I, I, I think we should just take a couple of more questions. Um, I think uh, there's some very interesting uh, qu questions coming in. Um, the, I think first question uh, probably is, it says, how does givoseran impact the pain associated with acute hepatic porphyria? Um, do, do you want to take a stab at it or I can, I can yeah. go with it? No, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so I, I, I guess we know ALA causes this condition. Elevated ALA levels, you know, they cause, it causes nerve damage and it's amazing it's, it's you'll we can talk about this too you know how many patients you have that you're treated with gibosran you see their ala pbg all normalize but they still have abdominal pain you know and and it, i think it takes a while because i think there's still permanent damage that has occurred in some of them you know some of them you know it's it it it, it, it you're you've lived your entire life with this abdominal pain and I think anytime you get some pain too, you start thinking, oh, this has to be a porphyric attack. Sort of like what you said before, you know, you got to think of other things too. And sometimes think outside of the box or outside the abdomen. Um, so so I, I think um, that with the nerve damage, even though it normalizes everything, some of that damage is not 100% reversible. Sort of goes with the liver transplant data too. Uh, and I think you hit it right on the head. And I was talking to, uh, there was a European meeting I just came back from like three, four weeks ago, uh, kind of the same experience. You know, the, the pain does not get better in a month. The ALA PBG levels normalize in a month, but it usually takes, you know, a little bit longer, four to six months. Uh, and even though they may have pain, uh, it's not as severe. I, I just saw a patient today who has been on, on gibosuran. Uh, her pain is more vague feeling of unwell and some some more neuropathic pain at this point. She's not having acute attacks. This is sending her into the hospital. And and I'm quoting her from today. It's, it's like I'm 70% better. So, so, and every patient is different. It depends how long they've had it. And everybody's pain threshold is different. So... It does, and that, and there's data that shows uh, from the study that they have improved, they have decreased narcotic requirement and improved pain levels. So, yeah. Uh, the next one is: I assume that once monthly subcutaneous administration of givoseran helps with adherence. Does the patient self inject, or is a clinic visit needed each month? Yeah, um, I don't know how many you have. I probably have 10 patients on treatment and it varies. It depends on where they live. You know, we, I live in Alabama and people come far away. Um, if they live close, I mean, we have them come to clinic, they get their sub-Q injection, they get their labs and they go. Um, some people though, their insurance won't allow that to happen here. And so they end up, we end up using their mail order pharmacy that essentially will ship the drug to their house and then a home health care nurse will come and give them their injection once a month. You know, and we, I still like getting labs the first couple months just to make sure 
you know, that the LFTs are fine, the creatinine's fine, and homocysteine levels are okay. So um, my preference is for them to come here, but I understand they can. If a home health care nurse can deliver it, make it happen. So in, in, in the Envision study that uh, Dr. McGuire presented data from, uh, there was one patient who had an anaphylactic reaction, right? Uh, and, uh, and that's why the FDA label calls for that the, the drug should be administered in a monitored setting. That's what I, I believe that's what the label says. Uh, and my practice uh, has been to administer at least the first three injections uh, in, in a monitored setting. Uh, and then you transition to a home health, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, L-Nylum has, uh, they have partnered with Panther and one other pharmacy to do that for a nurse to go out and give the injection at home. Uh, now, do I do that for all patients? No, but I try to do it. And it's certainly not feasible in some, you know, because uh, uh, they are worried, you know, and uh, so they come in. But uh, the, the goal is to transition to home after three months. Uh, uh, the next question I'll probably take uh, is, uh, are hematologists needed to administer hemin? Should they be involved in other aspects of management? Uh, well, I, I think, as you will see in the later half of this presentation, uh, the, uh, this is a, a disease that involves multiple organ systems, and, and, and the goal of the management to have a, is to have a multidisciplinary management. And I, I personally, there's few patients that I uh, have who get hemin through uh, my office. There are other patients uh, who get hemin through hematologist's office. Uh, so whatever it takes to take care of the patient, I think uh, that's what's needed. Uh, uh, and it's a multidisciplinary care uh, model that, that, that really needs to uh, uh, be in place. No, I agree. No, you answered that very well. Uh, do you want to take the next one about transplant? It says, uh, if a patient with AIP are not in hepatic failure, how do you convince insurance companies to pay for the transplant? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and I think that's why there's so few cases that have been done. No, but you're right. It will be an appeal letter, and we've done appeal letters for other transplants. Um, but you really have to lay out your cause. You have to lay out that um, they've tried... Heyman, they've tried Gavosran, they've tried everything out there. Um, you have to lay out if it's a rich issue with IV access, as I said, because they can thrombose IV access to do it that way. Um, is it an issue that they get, they show up on a ventilator and that's their first time presenting and you don't want them to get another attack? I mean, those are really the major reasons why you would do it. So, but you're right though, it would take an appeal letter, the insurance company would have to approve it. Um, and that's how you'd have to make it happen. All right. Let's let's take one more before we move on. Uh, and I, this one it says because uh, I think it's what we have covered uh, earlier. It says are the diagnostic urine tests for AHP relatively easy and inexpensive? And the second part is should they be done empirically for anyone with severe abdominal pain? Uh, uh, you know, they're easy if you know which one to order, right? So most of the times it's, it's, it's the wrong test that's ordered, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I cannot speak on how much they cost and how much, you, how much insurance gets billed on. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I've not had pushback saying, you know, they, uh, that they were really expensive. I've never heard that one. Uh, and maybe Dr. McGuire can let us know if he's heard that. But uh, to answer the question, should they be done empirically for anyone? Uh, I think if you have severe recurrent abdominal pain where the cause is unknown, I would recommend that they be tested for the ALA and PBG or PBG at, at the very least. No, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, but like everything else, you know, you have your differential. And I must admit for abdominal pain, it's not in the top list of of causes, and it shouldn't be because there's other life-threatening ones that need to be ruled out first. But I think once you start ruling out first and they still have abdominal pain, then I think acute hepatic porphyria has to be down um, after that. Right, and uh, let's, let's move on. I think we can come back to the rest of the questions uh, uh, once we keep moving. Uh, uh, 
So this is this is our last learning objective, which is to implement long-term strategies to manage and minimize disease burden in patients with acute hepatic porphyria. <clears throat> so we're going to go on to another uh, audience response question. The question is, how often should patients with AHP <coughs> over the age of 50 be screened with ultrasound with, with hepatocellular carcinoma? Annually, biannually, once every two years, quarterly, and I'm not sure. Let's go for it, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> so AHP over the age of 50. <clears throat> so uh, the correct answer is, is biannually. So over the age of 50, uh, you should be screened uh, every six months for HCC. So um, uh, th these are the long-term consequences of acute hepatic porphyria, which I will attempt to cover in the next uh, few slides, chiefly talking about HCC, hypertension, renal failure, and, and psychological trauma. Uh, liver uh, uh, is, is thought to be the major site of PBGD amnase activity. And a, a small percentage of patients with AIP will have non-specific elevations in the liver enzymes, especially during uh, an acute attack. Uh, uh, looking at the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, there was a Norwegian cohort of 251 patients, uh, and, and they looked at the incidence, annual incidence of HCC in this cohort, which was at 0.35%. And comparing it to uh, the, the general population, the risk of HCC was 0.003%. So in, in Norway, in their cohort, they showed there was a 100 times increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, a similar French cohort, which followed patients over seven years, showed a 36 times higher risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in gene carriers uh, as compared to controls. Uh, U.S. data was published a few years ago uh, in, in hepatology, and uh, in, in the consortium database, they found five cases of HCC uh, in a group of 351 patients, uh, conferring a 1.5% risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, it is thought that the 5-ALA dimerizes at supraphysiological concentrations, and which can it induce procarcinogenic precursors. So the recommendation uh, generally uh, within the field is, is that patients with AHP over the age of 50 should get an ultrasound every six months with or without an AFP. And obviously there is no data about the utility of AFP, but most of us will throw in an AFP at that point. Uh, hypertension uh, is another chronic uh, um, disease manifestation. 60 to 70% of patients with AHP have chronic sustained hypertension. Uh, and it, this may be related to autonomic dysfunction. Uh, and I was preparing for this talk. Uh, uh, in 1954, uh, they described neurogenic hypertension in a patient with porphyria from Chicago. Uh, and it was transient with tachycardia. It was an interesting article, but... Uh, uh, it had it, uh, so it's something to be aware of, and then they need to be treated. Uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, up to 64% of patients with symptomatic AHP have CKD. Now, this is independent of hypertension. Uh, the estimated decline in renal function is about by one ml per minute uh, per year uh, annually. Uh, and again, it's the ALA and PBG, the precursors which accumulate. Uh, which are thought to be nephrotoxic. Uh, there is recent data about how PEP T2 polymorphism may explain why some people are at higher risk of having elevated creatinine uh, as others. So there's a genetic predisposition, polymorphism that predisposes people to have uh, kidney disease in the setting of AIP. Uh, in the EXPLORE, which is the, which is the natural history study of AHP patients with recurrent attacks, it was a precursor study to the Envision study. Uh, renal disorders uh, were reported in about 10% of the patients. However, uh, when we looked at the medical history, 70% uh, had abnormal EGFR. Uh, so kind of similar 60 to 70% risk of chronic kidney disease. And 30% of these patients met criteria for chronic kidney disease, stage 3A, 3B, or 4. 
So I hope uh, you keep this in mind. 22% um, of patients uh, uh, with acute hepatic porphyria, as with other chronic diseases, uh, report uh, moderate or severe anxiety. Uh, uh, my guess is this is probably higher, but that's that's the reported. Uh, Fifteen percent have depression, and these, this population does have a much higher rate uh, of suicidal ideations uh, and suicide uh, rate in general. Uh, an important resource that I would uh, point to you guys in, and uh, this I'll be remiss. Uh, there are several drug databases maintained by several organizations: uh, the APF, uh, the the European Organization Drug Porphyria. Uh, as well as there's an app, uh, porphyriadrugs.com, that I encourage all my patients to download because anytime I tell them you're looking for a new medication, you need to check the drug database and see if they're porphyrogenic. Uh, another thing that I would probably mention from my clinical practice, I do ask them to get an alert bracelet. It, it, it makes sense that they get an alert bracelet. Uh, 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 finally, uh, the, the manifestations, uh, the disease presentations and patient presentations uh, uh, affect more than one uh, uh, organ system. Uh, and what we really need to focus on is, is a multidisciplinary approach, uh, which obviously involves partnership between hematology and gastroenterology, as mentioned, kidney disease uh, for, for nephrology. They need to be involved, psychiatry, nutritionists. Uh, and, and and pharmacists and and uh, and our physician extenders and providers who who you know who can be a resource in managing these patients uh, along with the primary care providers. Uh, so to summarize, uh, uh, we have to increase awareness of AHP in our practice to avoid long-term delay in diagnosis and treatment. And we have to implement diagnostic testing in appropriate patients and the right diagnostic testing, might I add. And you have to assemble a multidisciplinary team to provide comprehensive, acute, and long-term care of patients and certainly keep abreast of new developments as, as they become available. So we can take some more questions at this point. Uh, Dr. McGuire, uh, comments? Yeah, Manish, no, that's very good. You're multidisciplinary preliminary slide. The only other thing I would add is my secretary. <laughs> I don't know about you, but, you know, there are certain patients that are going to get hospitalized, you know, and they're going to have attacks. And, you know, every time because the, you know, the, the, their levels are really, really high and, and, and they're very predictable. Right. And so, you know, I almost, I tell my secretary, I say, Hey, if this person calls or that person calls, and they say they're having a porphyric attack, you just gotta believe them, right? And usually when they come in, I will always check ALA, PBGs when they come in, they're always elevated, you know? And, and so these people, they just, they know what their attack is most of the time, but you're right though, you always gotta think of something else. But if it's pretty typical, I will actually directly admit them to our hospital um, and put them on our liver service and we'll manage them uh, that way, so. Right, and I and, and to that end, I, I usually give a lecture to the fellows uh, at least once a year, especially the new fellows. Uh, we do have a, uh, an epic order set for porphyria, and you know, uh, at least they get attuned to if it's a known diagnostic, known patient. You know, they come in, just put them on hemant. You know, don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait for the PBG. So, so absolutely. Um, so yeah. I, I can take this next question. It says, how do you balance the efficacy of gibosuran with the risk of hepatic and kidney adverse events? Um, uh, let, let me start with the hepatic adverse events, right? Uh, certainly, it, it is a very effective drug, as, as, uh, as we've discussed, and it does change the life of these patients. Uh, uh, it does carry a risk of elevated liver enzymes, and for that reason, you monitor the liver enzymes at least in the first three months. And then I, I go on to every three months, I want them to have blood work done, you know, I monitor their kidney function. So it's not without risk. I'm not saying, you know, there's nothing 100%, but uh, if your liver uh, enzymes go up more than five times, then I consider dose reduction or stopping completely. Uh, kidney adverse events, uh, again, uh, there's a big nuance because I just showed you data how uh, patients have kidney disease even in the absence of gibosuran. So you have to monitor them closely. A lot of times they're dehydrated, you know, uh, and I tell them drink drink water in the morning before you get your CMP drawn. Uh, and believe it or not, it does come down by, you know, 50%, 30%. And uh, 
Uh, but that does not mean that, uh, that you don't monitor it, and, and it's a risk-benefit analysis. So I hope that answers your question. You want to go for another one, Brendan? Anyone? Uh, I think that, that answered pretty good. Um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll go with another one here. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Um, I don't know. There we go. Um, with... Um, um, while you do that, let me let me answer this one. Do you recommend pain management specialists for treating intractable AHP pain? Uh, the short answer is yes. If they have intractable pain, which is occurring, and it depends on what state you're practicing. If you have a New Jersey license, you cannot prescribe more than seven days of pain meds without seeing a pain medic medic medication specialist. So the answer is yes. Short answer is yes. What is the usual interval between attacks? Very variable. If, you, if a patient has recurrent attacks, uh, I do try to get them on uh, uh, givosuran sooner rather than later. Uh, and uh, would it be safe for patients to use opioids if attacks were spaced apart by several weeks? Uh, yes, and then I would refer you to the database. Uh, uh, you know, Go ahead, sorry, I, Brett. No, but I think you're right. I mean, that's where the multidisciplinary. Uh, do you have um, uh, palliative care at your center? Do they get involved uh, with patients? We have palliative care, but I, I don't think I've involved them for AHP patients, you know. Yeah, um, I have. I, I actually recommend it. I, I just think they have a different mindset than we do, you know. They are just more calmer. They are more, I think, understanding than I am. And they, no, it, it, but they've dealt with it at all spectrums, you know, from patients at end stage of life to patients with chronic disease. So I, I, I don't know about you. I don't have a chronic disease. And, and I think it would be terrible for anyone to have a chronic disease. All these patients do. And they just never know when it's going to jump up and start attacking them. You know, and, and it truly is a different world than I live in. And to live in fear knowing this pain is going to come up. So I, I guess I try to push them to talk into palliative care. And it's really just for pain management and dealing with stress and chronic disease that you mentioned earlier. No, that's a, that's a good suggestion. I mean, it's part of that, whatever it takes to take care of the patient, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have um, um, another question. Um, um, is there awareness of porphyria among different professions you listed? Uh, do you know about all the different symptoms that can occur? Um, I think really, though, your list, though, of the multidisciplinary approach, I mean, they will show up to different ends. Um, and um, so I, I, I think, you know, it's, it, it, it can show up anywhere, you know. And I don't know about what you've had in terms of referrals, but I can guarantee I've gotten it from, uh, have you ever gotten it from a nephrologist? I've gotten a diagnosis once from a nephrologist. So I thought, boy, that's a strong, astute position to do that one. No, you know? I have not. I had it from neurologists for sure, uh, yeah. uh, but but not a nephrologist. You know, I had a VP patient from dermatology, uh, but uh, not not nephrology. No. Yeah, um, uh, and uh, I actually had an internist uh, from rural Alabama here refer someone. That was pretty cool too. That he made the diagnosis and he did the right testing and everything like that. So you, you love when things like that happen. You know, so I think this this one here. Do patients often run into issues if they have to seek care in the ER? Uh, it seems like there would be a chance of them being labeled drug seeking or malingering uh, for people not familiar with the condition. So uh, yes, you know, people do run into issues when they go to the ER. You know, the wait times and uh, sometimes ER is unavoidable. You know, most days of the year, if I were to call a patient for an acute bed in my hospital, they're going to be waiting for like two days for a bed unless they go to the ER. Uh, and we don't even have them wait in our clinic because we don't know what time they get called in, 6 p.m. or 9 p.m. for a bed from the clinic. So uh, it's unavoidable at times. Uh, uh, and, you know, the second part, uh, that is true. And, and I think that is why it's important to come to a definitive diagnosis, you know, increasing awareness. And uh, once they have a diagnosis, and if you have a, an order set in your in your EMR, you know, people are likely to use it. They're going to, says order set says give hemen, you know, 
and, and you're going to use it. So, uh, and uh, you know, then they're, they're going to require less pain meds because you treat it early on, and hopefully, you know, that's not the solution, but at least that's part of the solution to the problem. Um, next how, how about another question? Um, patients with acute hepatic porphyrias, uh, they, you want to start a new medication, there's no data in the database. What do you do? Uh, well, uh, so obviously it's a risk-benefit analysis, right? Again, at that point, if there is no data, no, no uh, what's the right word, no, no, nothing in the database, I say, I, I have, I, I ask them a simple question, why do you need it? How much does it bother you, right? And if you don't need it, if it's a mild, let's say a mild pain, one out of 10, and a heating pad would do it, that's fine, you know? Um, uh, and uh, the second thing is you can monitor them, right? Uh, if they are on gibosumin, I, I, I have a, a patient who has a, a leukopenia, um, uh, and uh, they wanted to try her on a new medication. You know, uh, but she's lived with leukopenia for like 50 years, uh, so she decided not to do it. I said, "Hey," and this was pre gibosumin, and uh, when she was on gibo, and I, I said, "Go ahead, try it." But at that point, she's like, "I don't want it. I'm okay." You know, I just don't want to take it. You know, that's fine. So, uh, so I, I think it's a risk benefit and a discussion that you have, and and what your ability to manage that patient at that point is. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And uh, I had someone too, and I don't know what's right or wrong. Um, I said, I don't know whether this drug is safe or not. Let's check baseline PBGs. Have you go out, come back two weeks later or a week later, and recheck the PBG or ALAs. You know. And see if they increase, you know, and and that's all I know to try to. And I tried that, you know, whether that's there's science behind there's nothing. But if it goes up, you can say, hey, you shouldn't do this. If it goes stays baseline, you can say, okay, it's safe. But I think there's just so many new drugs coming aboard for various different conditions. It's hard for any of these databases, Norwegian or the American Porphyria Foundation, really to keep up on it. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think another question is, are there any issues with prior authorization or insurance coverage for Givosaran? Huge. Yes. <laughs> the short answer is huge. It's with anything. It's a very expensive drug, right? Uh, and uh, it takes few months, uh, unless until they have Medicare, uh, for it to get approved. Uh, and I think the other issue is... Uh, uh, it, you know, uh, the, at open enrollment time every year, you know, patients get dropped all the time. So, so that is an issue. Now, uh, this is not just an issue in our country, but also uh, other parts of the world. You know, uh, there is a growing uh, discussion in the community, in the field about how long do you be uh, on, on Givosra? And do you really need to be on a half a million dollar drug for the rest of your life? Is two years good enough? Can you space it out again? That's for That's beyond the scope of today. But uh, but those are all questions that are valid questions. So, yeah. Um, another question here: When is carbo loading appropriate as a treatment strategy? I mean, there's plus minuses, right? When you start someone on it, um, you know, unfortunately, people gain a lot of weight on it. And that's their biggest complaint. But I think if they start having people have a prodrome, sometimes they feel like they're starting to get some abdominal pain, and that's usually the start of it. Um, and I usually tell them to encourage them to start doing it. Um, and then, as we said, when they come in the hospital, you load them up pretty quickly. Right. And I think there's one last question that has not been answered. It says, um, uh, you said most people with AHP, which is rare to begin with and have no symptoms, is there any danger in living with AHP if it isn't causing patient symptoms? I mean, most patients with AHP are not being treated because they don't have symptoms. Uh, the indication for givosaran is patients who have recurrent attacks, right? Uh, so, and again, like I mentioned in my comment just a few minutes ago, people are saying, okay, well, how long do you need to be on it? So uh, uh, just because you have a genetic mutation doesn't mean you have a disease. Just because you have ALA, PBG doesn't mean you need to be treated. You could be an asymptomatic high excreter. If you're having symptoms, if you have elevated P ALA and PBG, you should be treated, especially if you're having recurrent symptoms. Yeah. Brenda, no, I agree. Uh, uh, and would you ever treat any? So I have people come saying, you know, I have a sibling that has it 
and they've gotten so I've had this recently, they've gotten so much better on it. <laughs> I know I have the gene defect, you know, can I get treated? And I go, well, what's your symptom? Well, they name a couple different organ systems. They tell me I have headaches, I have leg pain, I have abdominal pain, you know, and you check ALA and PBG and they're stone cold normal. And, and I won't treat anyone unless I have elevated ALA or PBG. And, and that is true. I mean, I, I kind of echo your thoughts. And uh, at that point, you know, I say it is, it is really beyond me because I don't have an answer, you know. Uh, we don't even have an answer for asymptomatic high excretors. Forget every, anybody uh, who has normal PBG, right? So uh, it, it probably is beneficial to lower the PBG, but again, it's probably, we don't know. We don't know uh, how long. And uh, because it's a chronic disease, it has other organ system involvements. So I don't know how you started when it first came out. I said, I'm going to the, all the patients that have been really hospitalized in the last year. I'm going to treat them first. And those are the first one I lined right up and right. I got them on treatment and I just wanted to see how they did with it, you know? And then after that, then I think I moved to the next group of patients that said they had pain. They weren't that severe. They weren't being <laughs> hospitalized for it, but they definitely had elevated urinary ALA and PBG. So I went after that next. And, <clears throat> and it's like when you talk to them, you know, like any other patient, you go, okay, I think this, I know this medication will lower your ALA PBGs. You know, I know you haven't been hospitalized. Here's what it does. Are you interested in trying it? And then go from there. And, you know, it, it's, it's very interesting. Some patients have just had the disease for so long. They're not sure what all their symptoms really are. And I've just had some people that say, once they start it, they go, boy, I feel so much better now. You know, and what do you mean? Well, I, I wake up every day. I'm more excited. I just have more energy and it's kind of crazy in one way, you know, but they, a lot of them just have had it for so long and they never had an acute attack where they're hospitalized for it, but they always had elevated levels, you know? So it's just, it's, it's interesting to see. And it, it's been fun treating people with uh, right. medications. Yeah. I think there's another question about gene therapy. Uh, so the Sp there's a Spanish group uh, who has uh, vectors and then they're looking at gene therapies and they had a presentation at, at this international meeting recently. And uh, basically the bottom line is that they're looking for funders or investors to invest so they could go on with the phase three study if I'm not wrong. Uh, so that's where gene therapy is. Uh, uh, some, somebody needs to either buy them out or, or fund them for, for the next phase of study. <laughs> so... You want it'll, to go get there. it'll get there, right? I'm sorry? Um, uh, it, it will get there. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we were at the presentation, and then after that, we came out and we're like, Alan Island was there. Why aren't they buying these guys out? What are they doing? You know, I was like, I don't know. But I guess, the you know, um, so anyhow, uh, that, that, is, that is what it was. We were kind of uh, surprised by his comment, you know? Everybody was like, wow, man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We will. And I mean, I think we'll get there sooner than later. It's actually been fun to see, you know. Oh, uh, the field has advanced so much, especially the, with, with the with the with the Gibbons run. Absolutely, there's no question. Yeah, and when, when you think about it, we had came in for we still have it, we still use it, you know. But we had it for 40 years, you know, and there was really nothing else in the field. Right. You know? So that is cool. Um, and. I guess we're running down on time, you know, thoughts to the crowd out here, you know, what should be their takeaways? What do you, what, what do you want them to take away with um, and remember uh, from the talks today? I, I don't think they can, they can type in their thoughts, Brendan. I don't think they can speak uh, uh, on the Zoom platform or whatever we're using. Okay, but no, but I, I mean. Oh, you I wanted guess, me to. Do, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. As, a, as a physician, I guess. Oh, oh patients, I, thought, I thought you were asking for more questions. For, I, no, no, my, no, 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 no. Okay. I, I th well, I, I, I think my, my, my thoughts to the group uh, is, is, I guess, you know, um, uh, thinking about it in the right setting, you know, uh, 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 and then 
knowing how to uh, order the right test. So I think establishing a diagnosis early on uh, and, uh, uh, and and then, you know, uh, treating these patients, uh, uh, which I, I think most people are, you know, familiar with or, or, you know, they can become familiar with with the help of the pharmacists or resources that they have available in the hospital. Uh, utilizing, um, uh, I think, a team-based approach to managing these patients um, and uh, and kind of going from there. I think that those were the top three things I would say. And, and I would throw out, and I agree with all your comments, but I think managing these patients have made me a better physician taking care of other patients with other diseases. And, and I guess I say that just because, you know, it is a chronic disease, you know, you're really relying on the patient to help you with the symptoms. It's not like, you can, you know, you can order ALA and PBG and find them elevated, but you really got to listen to them and listen to their needs and really spend time because, you know, most of them were really desperate before they had a diagnosis. And how many times have you talked to someone and they give you a diagnosis and they just are so relieved. They say, I have something now and I'm not crazy, you know? Right. You know? And so, oh, and absolutely. Respect. Yeah. So, I, I, I guess it's, you know, we go into this business trying to help people, but I think people help us and patients help us just as much as anybody else. So it, it's really very interesting and in how things come back around. Uh, but I think it's been fun, but um, okay. I'm, I'm rambling now. <laughs> no, I think, I think you gave good insight uh, and uh, a 10,000 feet view of, uh, you know, I, I agree. I think, uh, it, it can be challenging and, and daunting uh, to start off with, you know, uh, but uh, I think uh, the patients uh, that you can help are very appreciative and makes it worthwhile. It really does. No, I agree with you. Thank you. Um, we're just about out of time, and I really applaud the audience for really for all their excellent questions and really to keep this discussion going. So I really appreciated it. And I really want to thank uh, Dr. Thapar, uh, for his great discussion, and thank you really for joining us today. This was, I thought, very interactive. I thought it worked out very well. Thank and, you, Dr. McGuire. It's an honor, and uh, I would say I really enjoyed it. Enjoyed, and hope uh, the audience enjoyed it too. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And this is essentially our final slide. So uh, please continue to follow us on CME Outfitters on behalf of Dr. Manish Thapar and CME Outfitters. Uh, who will continue to provide education tools and practical resources to help uh, you and to help manage patients with acute hepatic porphyrias. We hope you found this webinar helpful and we look forward to interacting mm -hmm. again on future webinars. To receive CME or CE credit for today's program, please complete, complete the post-test and evaluation. You will be able to download and print your certificate immediately upon completion. Uh, thank you very much for everybody. Please be safe and have a good night. Thank you again. Bye-bye.